It's one o'clock and good, good afternoon and welcome to the second session of Azapo online political uh, discussion. Uh, last week, which was our first session, we opened by marking the assassination of Patrice Lumumba. And that began a week that had uh, that's, has seen a number of uh, uh, pantheons, history, uh, heroes in the African liberation struggle pantheon uh, who have sacrificed their lives to the liberation of black people world over America Cabral on the 20th of January. And today we're starting off this session at the tail end of the funeral of the late uh, <clears throat> minister in the office of the president. Uh, uh, the minister also had, has his roots uh, uh, in Azapo and uh, in marking his passing and his burial, we are also acknowledging the, the role that he has played in ensuring that a lot of South Africans do not succumb to the uh, COVID-19 disease, which unfortunately he succumbed to. So his work has not been in vain. And in remembering him and marking this moment, we mark and honor the passing of all those who have succumbed to uh, the COVID-19 uh, disease. Today, I am joined by a comrade, uh, a DC adherent, a Pan-Africanist, uh, comrade, uh, comrade Professor Simpua Sesanti, who is going to uh, speak to us about uh, decolonization and uh, decolonization and, uh, and and placing uh, Africa at the center of our education. Uh, Comrade Sasanti, uh, Professor Sasanti is a professor at the University of Western Cape WC, his faculty of education and the editor of the International Journal of African uh, Renaissance Studies. His PhD in journalism studies was obtained at the Stellenbosch University where he taught for 17 years in the Department of Journalism. He has also taught in the Department of Journalism, Media and Philosophy at the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University. Prior to joining the UWC, Sisanti worked for the University of South Africa, UNISA's Institute for African Renaissance Studies. He has published in accredited uh, journals on a uh, variety of issues, including education, gender, African philosophy, journalism, politics, spirituality. He's an author of two books, uh, a co-editor of one book and a contributor of chapters in a number of books. In 2018, he was awarded uh, the NRF uh, C2 uh, rating. Uh, welcome, Comrade Sesant. Thank you very much, Comrade Nguyen. Uh, yeah. uh, our, our, our format for, for, for these sessions is that we, we, we first allow our guest to, to share his thoughts on the topic. And thereafter, we engage in, in a conversation, a conversation that uh, will also involve uh, various participants yeah, on, on Zoom and participants who are joining us on our Facebook platforms, uh, various ASAPO pages. Uh, that have been set up across the countries and for various uh, provinces. Comrade Sesandi, um, I, I will uh, hand over to you to share your thoughts and, and then we will take it from there. Over to you. Thank you very much, Comrade. Comrade Sazan is moving the Ruzas Bassas Sizwe. It is suddenly filling me a moving bit with the low kind. Sneaking a matong or stamp playing out to the impinent Tamsang of Barman's and Nekunil and Mastini Tamako. Tamaka Gamnanti could swell as a cock of Bamkal of Mamma, a Macomas or Kupos Tongas or Toganamasad. If you let us much in the Watik as a Kosa was a one of the country's men, as a summon was named quite close to quantity bonus and a band bomb lamb, a macha would show how to call to go for Toman of Laung on Yaman. Amanda was so picture young and going to Amazon and Jama Cabral, who was in Buzanga on Yuluk. Amanda went to Chebelen to make a colibello quangwash. Is the same as a wind go colloquy and go to Kanaja and was always a corner of Gonga Kovachi or Kulakonikan, as a sang it named Katuni Kukum Kulel Dogofai, whose zone is this wearing a Zion cross band is busy and Makamaka Kamakosh. And with that, um, comrade gone <clears throat> and to all the comrades gathered, I'd like to extend um, a revolutionary greetings uh, to everyone that is present. Um, and perhaps I need not take for granted uh, because some of us have been uh, de-Africanized and some 
you know, um, have also been colonized and continue to be so. So um, I need to indicate to you that um, I was uh, communicating with the Supreme Being, the creator of all together with those, uh, with, the, with those that I was entrusted to, my ancestor spirits, um, so that um, I acknowledge their presence around me and also to request them to give me the necessary strength um, and the courage without which I've, I will not be able to do anything. And greetings to you as the chair of, um, of this uh, session. And um, let me confirm and endorse the point that you're making just in case um, some people may think that you're a claimant. I am indeed a child of the Black Consciousness Movement. Um, I am a child of the Azanian Student Movement um, of which I became a member in 1984, um, together with many comrades who have since passed on, the likes of um, of uh, Mnyaka and others. And uh, may they, you know, sing with and for me uh, beyond the grave and beat the drum, so that uh, I have the necessary courage uh, to do what I need to to to, to be done. Uh, today, um, Comrade Ngoni. Um, I have been asked by the Azanian People's Organization uh, to speak about decolonized and Afrocentric education. And I'd like to express my deep appreciation um, that uh, the Azanian People's Organization has seen fit uh, to invite their child whom they produced and whom they developed. And I hope that um, I'm not going to be a disappointment on this platform. And if I do do that, then it is only human. Um, it will be also an opportunity for me to learn. And so let us proceed, um, Comrade uh, Ngoni, and begin by saying that um, sometime in um, 2015, in this country, we saw brave young women and men um, who called themselves the Roads Must Fall movement, um, calling for a decolonized and Afrocentric education. It should be surprising for many of us that uh, so many years after 1994, um, the young people should be making this call, but uh, it is a clear indication to us um, that there was a recognition and, a and, and an appreciation that um, education continued to be Eurocentric and that uh, education continued to be um, colonized. And perhaps uh, people will wonder how come, you know, that such should be the case, um, taking into consideration that there have been claims that since 1994, um, South Africa had been decolonized and that the entire African continent had been the case. But the students were calling upon us um, to recognize a very important point that uh, being that, uh, you know, there is quite a difference between colonization and, and, and colonialism. And that in fact, this call that had been made by 2015 by the student was a call that had been made earlier on in 1995, um, 20 years earlier, um, by one of the academics at the Vets University in 1995, Professor William Malekha Puromahoba, uh, who had called for the Africanization of education one year um, after um, South Africa had come under the government of national unity and uh, a number of years. And so we recognize at this point um, that uh, we need to do a conceptual, you know, a distinction so that we may have clarity um, about the issues that we're engaging with. And so I'd like to begin by perhaps, uh, you know, defining a, a few concepts so that uh, we may depart um, from a common platform. And so by colonialism here, yeah, we are referring to a destruction of a people's uh, culture. And by culture, we're not merely referring to dance and music, although those aspects are part of culture. When we're speaking about culture, we're speaking about total complete way of life of a people. And there we are also involving the philosophical orientations of a particular people. And so what then colonialism does it that is that uh, it displaces a people's culture and, uh, and replaces it with that which is their own. In other words, um, what happens is that uh, it kills a people's memory and replaces it with their own. Um, and so with reference to colonization, we're speaking of a situation where an alien force occupies a people's land 
and take over. So that it does happen at times that uh, as it has happened in the African continent, we would witness um, you know, a granting or a gaining of flags in some parts and we would see some black ministers or black uh, uh, presidents. Um, and so in that sense, we see a renaming of a country from that of a colonial name to that which is regarded as African. And we see therefore when we think that you know, um, colonialism is done away with. And that is not the case um, because colonialism does not merely refer to a geographical issue, it refers um, to a cultural issue. And so it is for this reason, therefore, that uh, in spite of the fact that in many African countries, we saw um, this kind of a thing, a phenomenon taking place where we had uh, parliaments and cabinets that looked African but uh, Eurocentrism continued to take place because Eurocentrism entrenches itself amongst other fields and amongst other ways through education. And this is why therefore it is important um, that uh, we understand also what we mean by Eurocentrism. By Eurocentrism therefore, you know, it is an extension or a project of colonialism um, which refers to an entrenchment um, of a people's culture uh, imposing, imposing it upon those that have been subjugated. And so that therefore, you know, the purpose and the objective um, of Eurocentric education was to ensure that uh, long after, because they anticipated that they would not be able um, to nakedly and openly dominate African people forever. And so they anticipated a situation where they would need to proceed, even if they were not physically present and it is in that respect, therefore, that education takes place. Because what Eurocentrism does is that uh, it inculcates a people with its own values so that uh, people may begin to look at themselves and the rest of the world through the spectacles of, the, of colonialism and the colonialists and to, to assess and to judge themselves by those standards. So it is for that reason, therefore, that uh, Eurocentrism sought to ensure that uh, even when it has departed from the shores, those who take over will continue to perpetuate the values of that particular um, oppressor. And so education, therefore, you know, plays um, that uh, exercise. It is for this reason that uh, even in our discourse, um, when we speak, many of us will tell you that, uh, you know, um, we are going to deliver a Rubicon speech. Um, you know, that there are draconian laws and that there is a pyrrhic victory. And so that uh, when we begin to raise questions about what is meant by this, a person does not recognize um, when he's speaking about the Rubicon that uh, he's referring to a history of Europe um, where at a point, particular point you had crossed, there was no way you had come back. A person understands that uh, this is not a point of return, but does not recognize that that kind of conceptualization is rooted in the history of Europe. A person will tell you that uh, when he or she is speaking about period victory, uh, he or she is speaking about a kind of victory that is not real, but that which in itself, you know, is the same as being defeated, but does not know that uh, that kind of a person existed as a figure in Europe. The same applies when a person is telling about the draconian laws, does not recognize that in the history of Europe there was dracon, who had arbitrary laws, and as a result, that's why we're speaking about draconian laws. It is for this reason that when our, our intellectuals are speaking, um, you know, they speak about, um, they will tell you that uh, the idea of a philosopher king or a king philosopher is a platonic concept, not recognizing that in fact, Plato had visited Kemet, which is ancient Egypt, and that in fact, Plato had lent that kind of an approach in ancient Kemet, uh, in Kemet in Egypt, which is black Africa, that uh, it will not be said that uh, Kemet was a center of learning, an international center of learning where Europeans came to Africa to study philosophy. But when you are being told today, you're being told that uh, you know we get philosophy from Aristotle, from Plato, but you will not hear anything about Tahotep. You know, you will not hear anything about the instructions of Mercare. You are not hearing anything about the instructions of Hagemni. None of these are mentioned. So these, because these are central in the Eurocentric um, uh, project of education. 
um, African children are not being exposed to that. You will be told about uh, the oath, I think of Nightingale or something like that, but you will not be told that the first scientist who has recorded and from which they take, it was Imhotep of, uh, of Kemet. And so these are the kinds of things then um, that, uh, you know, when we speak about the decolonization um, of education, um, we are talking about what Ngugi Wathiongo has referred to as moving the center um, from the center of Europe um, to that of the entire world, where Africa regains and recaptures their rightful place in the world. But also, you see, the point about, um, you know, it's one thing to speak about decolonization, it's another to speak about re-Africanization. It's one thing to speak about Eurocentric education, it's another. And so we need to be saying that uh, to a very great extent during the, our struggle, many of us have been able to articulate what it is that we do not want, but we've not been able to articulate what it is that we want. We've been very articulate in, in opposing, but we have not been able to propose. And so therefore, when we speak about Afrocentric education, we are moving beyond um, opposing and centering and focusing on proposing. And therefore, therefore, that being the case, when we speak about Afrocentric education, we want to interrogate and what we mean by the philosophical underpinnings of the Afrocentric education. We begin by saying that uh, the philosophical underpinnings of Eurocentric education were that of making Europe a point of reference and the center. And when we refer to Afrocentric education, we are speaking about a philosophical perspective of, of examining issues um, and that of, of the world and Africa in particular from a historical and cultural point of view that is in Africa. And therefore, I need to be very clear that uh, Eurocentrism, I mean, Afrocentricity is not uh, the other coin of Eurocentrism because while Eurocentrism uh, imposes upon itself, its values upon the entire world, Afrocentricity recognizes the values of many and recognizes that uh, the human, the members of the human race, including in Africa, including Africans, must meet at the table of equality and exchange values um, and ideas. And so um, having said that, therefore, we do not seek to dominate or to control the world, but we certainly seek to make clear our stamp as, a, as an African people in the world. And having said, therefore, that, um, let me say, therefore, that uh, when we speak about Afrocentric education, um, what we're seeking to do is to emphasize the, the philosophical underpinnings. And it is here then that uh, when we examine uh, the history of the African continent, we see that in terms of education, our ancestors have always sought uh, to bring about, to recreate a human being that is going to be godlike. And when we speak about that as well, we need to interrogate what we mean by a godlike human being and a godlike human being in this regard. Uh, and I need to say here, uh, comrades, that uh, we must understand that uh, you know, scholars, whether they be of European or African origin, have always emphasized that one of the distinguishing features um, of the African people has always been um, spirituality. Um, and of course, yeah, we would have many saying that uh, African people um, are notoriously religious. And so I prefer to make reference to spirituality as opposed to, to religion. Um, because I also draw a, some kind of a distinction there. And so our ancestors, if then we are referring to God, we need to understand how God is understood and we need to make a very clear distinction that uh, whereas in other uh, spiritual approaches, God has been made. African people have recognized that God is unknowable, but in their endeavor to seek to understand God, they've understood God as both the mother and the father. They've understood God as both female and male. They've understood God as being neither male nor female and understood God as being neither father or the mother, but sought to, and this um, philosophical underlining is very important for us in the world because um, in, a, in a world where we are seeing um, an exploitation of women, um, there is a kind of an orientation that says that men are superior to men, I mean, to women. 
and that, uh, you know, human beings were created um, uh, uh, in the image of God and a God who is male. And for that reason, um, uh, uh, males uh, perceive and regard themselves as having the power over other human beings because they were created in the image of God. And so our ancestors told us that uh, God is neither male nor female, but God is both female and male. God is neither mother nor father, but God is both father and mother. And so therefore, on the basis of that, our God becomes a just God, becomes a merciful God, becomes a loving God. And so trying to recreate human beings in the image of God, we are recreating human beings who are compassionate, human beings who are loving, human beings who are caring, human beings who recognize that uh, it is not just human beings that need to be revered and who need to be respected, but that also plants and that human and that animals as well need to be respected and, 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 and treated with a sense of dignity. And so therefore, the kind of education then that is Afrocentric is that which seeks um, to displace a world that is sexist, a world that is oppressive to that um, which is uh, liberatory, to that which emphasizes not only human centrality, but also that uh, of creation in general. That, uh, you know, when, when we see animals, we are going to treat them with reverence, plants included. When we walk on earth, we do not walk with a sense of arrogance. We do so with a sense of humility. That, uh, you know, when we look at science, science becomes a means and the tools that we have at our disposal, all human genius um, is to be taken as a tool or as tools to develop human beings, not to conquer human beings, to subdue and to subjugate them. And we have seen in Eurocentric education that uh, it has created human beings who have got an elitist mentality, who have got an arrogant and aggressive mentality where power, you know, is that which is regarded as right um, and, um, and, um, and, and therefore should, should, should prevail over everything. It is for this reason, therefore, that uh, our philosophers in the recent age uh, told us amongst them, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, who told us that, uh, you know, um, we are fighting for the noblest cause on earth. And of course, this was later reiterated as one of our greatest philosophers, Mangaliso Sobuk, uh, who said that we are fighting for the noblest cause on earth, the liberation of humankind. And later, Bantu Biko would come and write a very beautiful essay entitled Black Consciousness and the Quest for a True Humanity. So that therefore, at the center of Afrocentric education, because yeah, comrade, uh, the point is, there was a very great appreciation. Our ancestors have never perceived or thought that uh, what we refer to as Mutu, what is referred to as Ubuntu, is an inherent thing in human beings, is inborn. They understood fairly well that uh, this has got to be inculcated, that a human being must be taught, and it is here that the centrality of education then takes place. And having said this, then you see in terms of practice, what then we are talking about um, is that if we were to refer to political science, um, we would um, refer to the, to the writings of Isocrates, uh, the Greeks who would tell you that uh, Greek scholarship acknowledged and understood that uh, true political science began in Europe. Uh, I mean, in, in Africa, in Kemet, um, and so we'll begin there for the for the for the for the students of political science. We'll tell them this: they will not have a false idea that uh, the question, the notion of state uh, uh, of state power, began there over uh, in Europe. Kemet. They are going to understand when they study um, when they study philosophy. Instead of beginning with Thales, as European philosophy does, uh, moving over to Plato, Aristotle, you name them. They are going to begin um, with the oldest extant book that survives, but we, will, we know that there are others that were there before them that are not, but are not con complete scripts. We are going to refer to the instruction, I mean, to, to, to the teachings of Tahotep. We are going to teach them about the instructions of Merikar um, and, and all of these um, uh, philosophical teachings. And, um, you know, these are practical. When we speak about mathematics, um, we're going to be able to say, 
that Africa is not making claims and, and make reference to the writings of uh, Plato um, in his book, The Laws, where he says that um, in, in Kemet, uh, children were able to master mathematics uh, in a manner that adults in, in, in ancient Greece or Greece were yet to, to be able to, to study. In terms of literature, um, as Ngugi Watyongo, uh, you know, uh, tells us, um, we're going to expose African children first and foremost to literature that is African, um, because Ngugi Watyongo argues in his book, Decolonizing the Mind, that uh, you would not have a Russian child or a Chinese child being first exposed to literature that is written by Europeans as opposed to that which begins in Africa. And so we will have our own uh, classic texts. When we speak classic, people tend to think about uh, you know, the writings of Shakespeare and all that. Our own classic texts will have those that I've already referred to, but we will begin by teaching them the writings of uh, Solomon Plaiki, um, um, uh, A.C. Jordan, uh, uh, Mkai, and all of that. Um, and, and therefore, you know, we will do this. But first and foremost, we must recall a, a very important point that was made by Sheikh Anta Diop uh, in 1948 um, when he wrote his essay, When Do We Begin to Speak of the African Renaissance? And Sheikh Anta Diop said that there is no way we can meaningfully speak of the African Renaissance and unless and until we reclaim and redevelop African languages. Uh, because there's a false perception that, uh, you know, um, um, there is no genius, there is no intelligence um, in African languages. If you need to feel, I mean, if you need to sound philosophical or intellectual or intelligent, you must speak English or French or Portuguese, um, you know, and that they made this uh, ethnic. And, you know, when people speak, they tend to think that um, uh, Portuguese, English, French have always been international languages. But the truth of the matter is that uh, French um, is no less ethnic than Isikos. English is no less ethnic than Sisoto. Portuguese is no less ethnic than Kikuyu. And so all these are ethnic languages, but through which the Gan, uh, through the Gan and the Swed, they were made international languages. And that's why Ngugi is daring and moved to the position of saying, uh, that, um, uh, you know, we must begin, even begin to, to renegotiate the international languages. And he pushes forward Kiswahili, uh, the language of our ancestors, as a language that can be an international world, language. An African language can be international language because African languages have never grown on the graves of other people's languages like European languages have. And so, Comrade Tabs, I only have five minutes, and in that five minutes left, uh, yes, so I'm, I'm very, I'm very disciplined in terms of time. I know that I began at 103, and calculating so my 30 minutes is at 133 for great time. And so, having said that, therefore, you know, um, in in then reclaiming and um, bringing um, and saying that uh, Africa, as Biko would say, that uh, our greatest gift to humanity um, would be that of giving the world a human face. Um, we need to revisit as African people at least three concepts, uh, those being, um, you know, the notion um, of ancestor reverence um, in our culture, uh, the notion of family, and the notion of consensus. Um, and very briefly on the question, the why this is important, uh, the question of family, we will understand that in African culture, when you speak family, you're not speaking about the nucleus. You are speaking, and in the philosophical terms, you know, we say, we speak about those who came before us, the ancestors, us who are living and those that are yet to come. And Gugi says the ancestors are our inspiration and we are the perspiration and those are yet to come are the, are the aspiration. So that in our living consciousness, we teach ourselves that for as long as we live, we must honor the greatness of our ancestors, their philosophical greatness while we live. But also we must not be greedy. As we live, we do anything and everything that we can to make a better world for those that are yet to come, for the children that are not yet born. In terms of the consensus, we recognize that uh, the question and the notion of democracy is not a new thing for the African people. It has always been there. And in terms of ancestor reverence, we know that those are the ones who gave us everything that we have and that we must never have a sense of arrogance and think that we are the first we are, and we are the last to be here. There have been those that have been here before us and that those that are yet to come, 
and you must have a sense of humility. Mwila zongi zizo za kuwetu, as the Zan Pamanda, Zan Lomeleza, Zan Kinsa Matoro, wate kwa bangu kwa mastini kamako. Samako Kumre, Kumre Professor Sesan, I am very happy that you started off by just dealing with some of these concepts and I would like us going forward just a short bit to sort of organize our discussion around those three concepts. I think one of the concepts you, you, you spoke about was this whole thing of Eurocentricity, uh, decolonization and Afrocentricity. So starting with uh, Eurocentricity, um, sort of paraphrasing maybe what uh, you have said is essentially to, to, to center uh, European values, uh, to make them the paramount values that all humanity should follow and to make uh, Eurocentrism also makes the claim that you, Europe and its ways and practices must are the ways and practices that all of us uh, must adopt and uphold. Now, have been giving us that definition of Eurocentrism. Can you can you speak to us maybe in, in, in relatively more concrete terms? I know you mentioned some how it manifests itself within our education system, uh, because there are those who would say that, for example, scientific education, even social sciences and natural sciences, is a study of natural phenomena. So the, the, there's no issues of values and so on. So what do you get of saying? Uh, it, 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 this is, it privileges European values. So can, can, can you then help us in debunking that, that argument? To begin with that, um, in, in terms of practice, um, comrade uh, Tabs and the rest, you would recognize that, um, you know, when I was at Stellenbosch University, um, where I taught in fact for seven, not 17 years, um, where I taught uh, journalism, journalism as a subject or as a discipline, uh, we know that has always been used as an instrument to subjugate the rest um, to exercise what is called mental science. And so in terms of Afrocentric education, I came with that at Stellenbosch and emphasized that uh, the purpose of communicating um, and, uh, you know, is, is always, has always been um, as the teachings of Ken, ancient Kemet that uh, ours must be always to tell the truth and to advance it with the sense of justice, not the injustice that has taken place um, in the world. And so to seek, um, you know, um, uh, as I said earlier on, for, 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 for justice. And so going back to the issue that uh, you had raised earlier on in terms of the natural science, I was, I was practical as well there. I made reference to Imhotep and said that Imhotep, you know, is the one whose um, writings are the oldest. And having said that then, you know, what has happened is that uh, there's been a false perception that uh, science and mathematics can be understood only by a few, by, a, by an intelligent few, and that some people do not have the capacity, which is very false. And I said that earlier then, that uh, one of the disabling factors in terms of comprehension of mathematics is that it has been communicated in a language that is not understood by those people. That's why decolonization must come in the form of languages and that, you know, everything must be taught in the languages that people under understand. And so therefore we began to demystify that. But also, not only that, when I was speaking about philosophical underpinnings, I was emphasizing the fact that um, technological inventions uh, by the European world have been used in such a way as to advance the interest of a few, selfish few, as is the case in our world today. Uh, but that in truth, uh, science, mathematics, and anything and everything at our disposal uh, must be used for the benefit of the entirety of humankind, not to subjugate human beings, not to disempower human beings, not to make human beings, you know, feel weakened, but rather to empower. And that, you know, we must be sincere and practical. When we say that you, uh, education is a right, we must be clear that uh, it, it, it must be accessed by any and everyone. Um, it becomes a human right in that sense, not only in terms of, uh, you know, the theoretic and giving lip service. It is that everyone, because the point here um, is not in the capital, you know, the capitalist system emphasizes the point of a, of a profit and profit is benefited by the few. So that um, the entire ideological framework then of Afrocentricity is that of uh, using anything and everything for the benefit of humankind. So uh, uh, for, for me, one of the easiest ways of showing that uh, uh, the current education system is Eurocentric is, is actually looking at the curriculum. 
if you look at the curriculum that we get taught from, from uh, primary high school, particularly at university, you would not think that there is any, you would think that there's no other scholarship except scholarship that emanates from Europe and uh, people of European descent generally. Because when you look at all the theories, be it political science, be it economics, and in any field, there is no diversity in terms of the, uh, the various authors and the various scholars that come. So it, it basically, you study Europeans and their pursuit of knowledge uh, across the board. I think one of uh, a classical example of what you've mentioned when you speak about uh, philosophy is that in philosophy schools, you study uh, Western philosophy, that's what philosophy, and then uh, uh, um, something like African philosophy would be, would be uh, put into African studies, or even uh, Oriental philosophy would be put into Oriental school, whereas the whole notion according to uh, the people who set up the curriculum is that philosophy in the strictest sense is then the study of those uh, European thinkers and all others are sort of peripheral. So it's that whole thing of centering European thought and European scholarship and putting to the periphery any other uh, 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 scholarship and, and uh, research that exists out there in the world. Uh, what, what would you say to that, uh, to the centrality of how our curriculums are structured currently as, as things currently stand. That is precisely the point. Um, and let me begin by the practical and say, when um, I, was, I left, I came to the Nelson Mandela University in 2014, and I left in 2016. Um, one of the things that we did very quickly was to disturb and to disrupt the, the, the curriculum. Um, we began to introduce uh, the philosophy of Ma'at. Um, that of uh, of um, of uh, Kement, uh, ancient Egypt, um, because you see, uh, the philosophy of Ubuntu Butu, um, is one that is taken for granted by many people, and they twist it to suit their own selfish interests, um, and uh, you know push this and that way, being made wishy washy, and after that has been done to it, uh, people come around and say it is wishy washy, and yet they made it wishy washy, um, and so we did that. Uh, we 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 taught Maat Maat. Um, at the Nelson Mandela University uh, to, to effect that change. And you're quite correct. Uh, and so that's why earlier on, um, I, I said that, um, you know, um, we, we, we shall not even begin when we speak about, um, you know, African philosophy to begin with the recent philosophers. Um, we begin with ancient philosophers that preceded um, the philosophers of Europe, uh, from whom, in fact, the, the European philosopher from whose feet the you know, European philosophers learned. Um, and we were able to do this uh, by not even making uh, you know, claims that cannot be followed, um, by, by ma making the very reference to the Egyptian, I mean, to the, to the ancient, uh, I mean, to the Greek writers like Isocrates, like Herodotus, Plato themselves, um, um, I'm trying to Plutarch. Um, all of these are Greek authors and they make testament to this. And then we go directly. Uh, to that which is African and come up, as I said earlier on, with the instructions of Mercare, uh, instructions of Kagemni, uh, Tahotep, and there are so many others, and we, and we need to, but at the moment, uh, these names that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm citing, you know, are very alien uh, to the students of philosophy. They've never heard about them at all. And so um, what has happened is that the, the philosophers that have the benefit, the African philosophers, that have the benefit of being, um, you know, cited, uh, and and whose works are used, like Cheche, who is from Ghana, we read do, um, uh, and all of them and others, um, are philosophers who themselves, you know, to a very great extent, are engaging with European scholarship, and so again, European scholarship becomes privileged, and so when, what we are then saying is that in addition to those, we need to be engaging and um, putting on the table philosophers and philosophy that uh, examines African issues on its own terms, not a uh, philosophy by Africans that is dealing with European philosophy. So when we do that, when you get my work, for instance, the way I'm engaging with Kant, uh, I'm engaging with Hegel, uh, I'm engaging with, uh, uh, you name them. I have not brought anything really. I'm still at the same point that uh, Europe has put me at. And so we need to go beyond those kinds of writings and introduce that which is African. So um, we, we, that's what we are busy doing 
in the institutions of learning. But that requires hard work because the truth of the matter is that uh, when you do that, you need to move out of your comfort zones um, as an academic. It means that um, you also become like a student who has just, who's just come. We must have that you need to accept that uh, we are beginning as first year students because we were not exposed to that kind of education. We may be professors uh, that we are proud to be, but professors who have been nurtured um, on Eurocentric education, that's the reality. So that therefore we, we are called upon to have the necessary courage uh, to go and begin to study what we do not know and bring it to the fore. You know, the other thing I was fascinated, Comrade Tabs, the other day, I was read, I, I recall as I was growing up in the Black Consciousness Movement, um, that uh, amongst many cadres who were doing political education, they would always uh, make reference to Paul Freire, the pedagogy of the oppressed. Um, and I checked the date that this work was published, and if I'm correct, it was published in 1970. That's why it was so popular in the Black Consciousness Movement after the coming to the fall of Sasso in 1968. But the irony is that um, I've never had uh, cadres of the Black Consciousness Movement referring to the work um, of uh, Walter Rodney, not how Europe and developed Africa, but groundings with my brothers. And I checked that the date, this date came out, this book came out in 1969. Um, and yet that book is such a powerful book uh, that makes reference and deals with issues in terms of uh, liberating education. And so that uh, even those of us who come from a BC, Pan-Africanist background, you know, continue to be limited uh, by Eurocentric uh, kind of uh, curricula, even as, we, as much as we try to do otherwise. Uh, it, it, I think, Comrade, you have, there's a bit of an unfair uh, uh, punch that you've thrown to BC and Pan-Africanist comrades. Let's, let's put it this way. Maybe some of the comrades you've interacted with have not mentioned or cited those other texts by Walter Rodney. Of course, the, the, the famous one is, is uh, our Europe underdeveloped uh, Africa. Uh, I've never heard you citing crowndings of my brothers, <laughs> crowndings with my brothers. <laughs> so this is not about me and you, Comrade Cezanne. Uh, so I, I am going to allow uh, uh, other comrades and uh, 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 to speak. Uh, comrade Sombi, uh, are you ready to share with us your thoughts? If you would uh, unmute uh, yourself, let's see. Comrade Sombi, see? Hey, come up. Come on, come on with that. Yes, yes, yes. Mualimo, uh, we, we reconnect again. Good to, good to hear from you again. Of course. Um, yes. No, just first thing, I want to say congratulations to Azapo, you know, for choosing you in particular for the subject. Um, I, I think it was a very appropriate uh, choice because this is a very sacred subject, very close to my heart, and... Uh, a lot of people mess it up and you, of course, have taken the road uh, less traveled on it. So it was a brilliant wisdom on their part, you know, that they have chosen you. And I like the Afrocentric part because not all decolonization is necessarily Afrocentric. Um, that's the first point. The second one is, uh, I would just want you to talk on two things, if, if time allows. The first one is, in addition to Kim Ed, uh, we also know there's Sudan, there's Songhei, there's Mwena Mutapa, there's also Benin, there's also the Lebombo bone calculator, you know. Uh, I would also would want to know how important is it to also know about those civilizational uh, contributions, you know, who are not necessarily in the northern part of Africa that is now controlled by the Arabs. That's the first one. The second one is... Um, there is a campaign, you know, many campaigns actually now, which is growing to get the stolen art artifacts. Uh, they are estimated to be at over a million that are stored in the various museums and libraries, palaces, and even universities in Europe till this day to get those returned uh, to, to Africa. As you would know, the most spectacular of those is the Benin bronzes, you know. Uh, how important is that for the project of uh, Afrocentric or decolonized, you know, Afrocentricity, because another important part of our civilizational contribution is our art and architecture, especially our sculptures. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sophie. Uh, Comrade Sassange. 
Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Chair. Uh, with reference to the first question, I'm very happy. Um, there's always criticism that um, Afrocentrists are preoccupied with Kemet, as if Kemet was the only civilization. I see Comrade Tabs nodding because it's one of those that has raised this criticism. Um, and uh, many Afrocentrists have raised this point, have responded to that. Uh, the first was, um, you know, Sheikh Anta Diop made it very clear, and those that came after him, uh, like Ivan Van Satima um, and others, Kwam, I mean, um, Molifika Asante um, and others who have made it, and Karenga, we have made it very clear that uh, Kemet is not the first ancient African civilization. In truth, in fact, and this is where the debate about the name Africa also comes from, uh, comes at the, I mean, there are many who claim that uh, this name is um, originally comes from Europe somewhere and that the Romans and the Greek and they named us. This is not true. It is traced to the, to the, to the, to the, to the, to the, to the ancient African language where it is shown that the ancient Egyptians understood that they came from the east of Africa. Um, Africans believe that we came from that east of Africa, the Horn, and we, we moved over to the north, to the west, and to the south. The only reason that uh, Kemet has occupied a very important space and place in our hearts, it is that it has had reference, literature that has remained that we're able to make reference to. But they themselves understood and traced their history right down to Nubia, to the Tukush and all that. And there were times um, when those who were residing um, in the, in um, who referred to themselves and the Nubians, there were fights amongst them sometimes and they took over and ruled uh, Kemet. And so uh, that civilization um, is not, uh, there, there are older civilizations than that, but we celebrate this only because we can make reference, concrete reference to that. It, it, that's all. Um, it is not, a question that when you see certain cultural practices that you see in, in the East, in the South, and such as libation, that uh, we think that we took this from the ancient Egyptians. It is the other way around. They took it with them to the North um, from, from the, the inner part of Africa, and they recognized and identified themselves as such. History uh, is full of pages that makes this point. So um, that is the first, and so therefore, you know, we need to, to, to make reference and claim all the history of the African continent, because when we do this, um, that is also going to help us in, 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 in an important uh, aspect, uh, that of Pan-Africanism. Uh, because when we study, um, you know, the variations, and instead of what we refer to as uh, difference, but rather variations of African culture, we're then going to be able to make and endorse our claim and argument that we are aware one people um, as African people. Um, when then we study one another's African languages, we're also going to be able to see all the similarities that are there, that point not to, because language is not merely um, a carrier of culture. Language is also a collective memory bank so that when you make reference to languages, um, you're able to say, but you're using the same, this mulikan, umlingan, eskosin, we say umlingan. You go and check in Sesotho languages, right? You have that concept. That concept is not just, it is talking about equality uh, between, amongst other issues, you know, gender equality. And when you're able to make reference to that, then the same with making reference to Kemet, to Azania, uh, to this and to that, then you're able to, to, to bring the consciousness, the Pan-African consciousness amongst the African people and not focus on one at the expense of the other. Thank you. And now having moving to the to the next point, um, making reference, we need to, as African people, um, you know, there is no question about it that uh, all and much that was taken from the African people was not negotiated um, at the at the table. Never mind that now we're sometimes begging and pleading um, that uh, what is ours must be returned to us. So let me begin by saying that at the moment um, we're in a very weakened position. Uh, position. We continue to appeal and to plead and to beg for what uh, you know belongs to us, and that in itself is very weakening. Um, uh, but we need to make the necessary noises and the necessary declarations that what is in the hands of Europe belongs to us. But that uh, that must not reduce us to a position where where we beg and plead for what is us, for what is ours. 
what that must do is to raise the consciousness of the African people um, that they restore power to themselves, you know, to reclaim the African continent in every aspect, not merely for us to vote and to be in parliament and all that, but economically, culturally, militarily, um, so that it is when, you know, the African people are in true power that uh, we shall not appeal to anyone. We shall not even have a need to ask for what belongs to us. Others will do it voluntarily because they know um, they are, we are going to do to them what they've done to us all along. And so we must, re, we must re restore um, uh, the means uh, by which we can get everything that belongs to us. Mm. So uh, Comrade Sassange and, and uh, Comrade Sompi also made this uh, nice distinction between decolonization and Afrocentricity. Uh, I think in, in your input, you, you had alluded to the fact that uh, decolonization is about recognizing that all human beings have developed uh, knowledge and that it, it is about encompassing all that uh, knowledge in our curricula so that we get to understand that not only Europe uh, essentially produce knowledge, that every human being uh, Produce knowledge. Now, the Afrocentric uh, uh, aspect of it, uh, can you speak a little bit more about it? Uh, what does it actually mean in terms of the knowledge, uh, the text, and the, and, and the sort of subjects that we engage with uh, at uh, universities and at school? I, I mentioned them all, comrade. Um, I, I spoke about you know, I spoke about political science, about sport. In all subjects. Let, let me begin by saying, you know, one or perhaps one what doesn't come out very clearly is that when we speak about, or let us draw the link, uh, the, what Comrade Sompisi was, was saying is that uh, when in terms of Afrocentricity, ours is not merely to oppose, but to propose. That must be very clear. We're not just rejecting one and not coming with the alternative. That also must be very clear. And having said that then, we, we are proceeding to be saying that uh, the, the, the priority in, um, in Afrocentric uh, curricula, curricula is that we must first and foremost bring the consciousness to the African people about that which they are, um, you know, and what which they are not, uh, because also that is very important. What we are and what we are not, what we propose and what we oppose. Um, because in as much as we study and read and learn uh, that which is not ours, uh, we must emphasize uh, we do not embrace anything and everything that comes. Uh, we reject certain values because we regard them as inhumane, as um, as cruel and all that, and, and we embrace these that we are regarding as humane. And, and having said that, um, we we do not have the short-mindedness and the narrow-mindedness of our of others um, who have devalued other people's knowledge and said that uh, it must not be studied. Africans um, must study anything and everything that is there because. If as, as, as any human being must be able to know one's own strengths, but also one own weaknesses. You don't stop there. You go and understand others' strengths and others' weaknesses. You go and establish that which is common between you and others, and that which is similar between you and others. And so um, having said that, therefore, that's why uh, you, you know, in, in order to be able to, to, to argue, meaningfully and um, intelligently um, about what has been done to you is that you must make an effort to study history properly. And so you, that's why I was able, I, I, I make it an effort to read ancient, I mean, uh, classical scripts written by Plutarch, by Isocrates, by Herodotus, um, and, and here this one is gone, Plutarch, Isocrates, Herodotus, and there's another one, uh, but I read them. And so, and, and in that, we, we make reference to mathematics, I made reference to, to science, I made, made reference to literature, to history, and all of this. You know, um, educa education, uh, what, has, what it has done to us is that it has been compartmentalized. Uh, you think that as a student of history, you must not be interested in, in, in natural science. As a student of natural science, you're not interested in accounting. All of these. Um, the approach uh, to our, our ancestors' approach to education was one that is holistic, without uh, turning a blind eye to the fact that uh, one may be strong in one aspect and not strong in another, but you must have a holistic understanding of because all these, you know, speak to one another. Though it may not be as possible that uh, you may you may specialize in all. Yeah. 
Uh, we have uh, questions and I'm, I'm inviting comrades uh, and, and uh, fellow participants in this platform to uh, to share their questions. We have one question from uh, Tsepo Marufani who says, uh, how and where do we start the process of decolonizing our education system? Will it help us as Africans? Uh, this is from Koluma Shavela. Uh, will it help us as Africans if we ditch the English alphabet and revert to the Kemet alphabet? And uh, one last question on, on uh, Zoom chat, which uh, is uh, intriguing, is how do you decolonize physiology, Prof? Question mark. This decolonization of science is a red herring. It's impractical at an atom level. So uh, over to you, Sasan. You can start with, with, with uh, whichever hey, could you, you kindly to. Could you kindly capture them again, one, two, three? Okay, let's start with the one that uh, I'm finding very interesting now. Number one, how do you decolonize physiology, Prof? Question mark. Uh, the decolonization of science is a red herring. It's impractical at an atom level. That's one. Uh, the num uh, number two is how and where do we start the process of decolonizing our education system? Uh, question mark, will it help us as Africans if we ditch the, the English alphabet and revert to Kemet alphabet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's the three. Let's deal with that three for now and then I'll have the sign let, for let, Facebook. Let us start with the, with the one that you find very interesting, uh, Comrade Chen, and begin by saying that, um, you know, the, the, there was a stage in the history of humankind where it was taught that um, as, as part of science, that uh, the, the brain of the African is compressed. Um, it cannot think properly, right? It, it, it does not possess intelligence. Um, we have been told that uh, the, gen the genes of the Africans are inferior to those of the rest of humankind. And that um, Africans are created in a particular, I mean, are, are their physical makeup, is such a way that uh, it makes them inferior. And so all these kinds of claims have been made by the European world in order to justify why Africans must be treated as animals. And one, you know, um, one of them said that, uh, um, you know, the, the, a, an ape may look like a human being, but the reality of the matter is that an ape is an ape and a human being is a human being. And the equivalence of that argument was that an African may look like the rest of other human beings except for their color. But the fact that, you know, Africans look like human beings doesn't make them human beings. And so all those kinds of claims have been made in the name of science, of scientific study, right? And so if those kinds of uh, claims have been made in the names of science, it is important, it is a colonial mentality. It is a, 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 a colonial kind of education. And so African people, you know, on a basis of science, and you must understand this, um, you know, Sheikh Anta Diop was a scientist. Um, and Sheikh Anta Diop had to go and, 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 and embark on a science to determine, because there was a stage when it was claimed that uh, the ancient Egyptians, were actually not black in terms of skin color, but they were white as in terms of Europe, because the civilization and the, and the, and the genius of Kemet could not, should not be associated with African people. And all those kinds of names, I mean, claims have been made in the name of science. And so, um, um, of course, you know, one would need to be sympathetic without a, an understanding historically of this. And this is what has been done uh, to men who have studied science. They've been given natural science and thought that X is just X and X is just Y, and they have no sensitivity to the question of uh, history. And so when you don't have a sensitivity to the question of history, and when you don't know how natural sciences have been used, um, you know, to advance and to perpetuate racism, then you can always say that, uh, you know, it is, it is, it is an empty uh, claim. Um, 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 you know, uh, our first, when, when therefore, the, the first, um, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, person to raise that, raises that kind of an argument, because I, I will not condemn the person, because I can I'll appreciate the fact that um, there is a vacuum 
and it is a vacuum of historical consciousness. When historical consciousness is absent, you cannot understand the kinds of uh, issues that are being waged in the present. So I leave it there and rest it there and say that uh, though historically it is there, um, that uh, this is what has been done now. Historically, when you do what the, the point you're making, um, you're going to establish the fact that when we deal with human beings uh, physiologically, we recognize that there may be differences such as this and that, melanin here, melanin there, uh, but it does not necessarily mean that uh, because one human being possesses one thing and the other does not possess it, um, automatically, naturally, it means one human being is superior to the other and the other is, is naturally inferior to the other. Let us go to the question uh, of uh, the beginning of decolonization. Um, I'm very glad that this, uh, this kind of question is being raised again. It takes me to, uh, to the question um, of, um, of, uh, of uh, uh, Walter Rodney. And let me begin here by saying that education is too important an issue to be simply left to educationists or you know, uh, people who are involved with education like me, uh, teaching in a university and all that. True education, it has always been the case. Africans have always historically had institutions of learning, but true education begins at home. Let us begin to do that. The reason, in fact, that uh, it has again got to do with the question of oppression, because before, you know, the, the fact of colonialism, uh, the grandmothers, the fathers and the mothers were responsible for primary education of their children. Before children were taken to the greater and broader community and taken to initiation schools. So the decolonization of education must begin with us in our own homes. It begins with us, it begins with me, as simple as I to liberate myself um, from Eurocentric and education. And when I've done that, I extend it to, the, to, to my family, my children, and all that, the children of my sisters and my brothers, to my nieces and nephews and then uh, to the entire community. Now, one of the, one of the powerful and striking features of the approaches um, of uh, Walter Rodney, who has written How Europe Under Developed Africa and amongst other books, Groundings with My Brothers, was that Walter Rodney, um, you know, um, did in the universities where he taught, he taught in the classroom, but also taught, uh, gave public lectures when that was not yet a fashionable thing to do. Uh, but beyond that, he also has written that uh, he went to what is referred to as the as the dumps, as the ghettos, as the as the slums. You know, he engaged um, with the ordinary people. He took everything that he had and took it to those who could not afford it. And so, um, as we engage, therefore, you know, um, with our with with the decolonization of education, um, those of us who are scholars and those of us who are academics. Um, who have this kind of task, have a responsibility, as is the case now. Here I am, I am on the platform of the Azanian People's Organization. I'm not on the platform of the University of the Western Cape. Um, but it goes beyond that. We, we must be involved with community organizations. We must be involved with cultural institutions in our communities and to share and make meaning of what we're, because ultimately, um, when we are going, when we can speak meaningfully, about about um, about education. It shall not be, um, you know, institutions are not going to, to be uh, spaces and places of only the few who can afford. And I'm talking about primary right up to, um, to, to, to tertiary education. It can happen because when we begin to rethink and to reconfigure the economic system itself, because the economic system cannot and must not be divorced uh, from what we are doing. We are forging for an economic system um, that is not going to be geared towards the profit of the few, uh, but that is going to benefit all the members of human race who occupy, who occupy a space. And so therefore we're referring um, to Afrocentric and decolonized education as that, um, which uh, is going to give access to any and everyone uh, who is referred to as human. And the last question um, referring to alphabets and all that, and again, the emphasis um, was, was, on, was on alphabets and all that, um, we are not, uh, you know, uh, preoccupied with either this or that. Uh, but the point of the matter is that the reason that uh, we're even arguing for, you know, the, re the restoration of our languages uh, to their dignified and rightful place is that um, our African languages have been, dis have been displaced and uh, they've been marginalized. And so it is very important then 
if um, right here, here we are, um, you know, as African people, we are speaking to one another in English um, instead of, uh, I would have uh, very much preferred uh, to speak in Sisutu, however little I know the language, instead of speaking English. But I'm quite conscious that uh, if now I were to speak, um, you know, Sisutu, uh, uh, even so, that type of a thing. And so we should be able to speak to one another um, across in our own African languages, um, not be compelled to speak to one another as Africans via Portuguese, English, or French, as it is the case. So that's where the issue is. No, I see. We are like I would say, given this, given the room in admiration of the attempt to Yako Congrate. Uh, you, you know, I, I would like to throw in my two cents worth as well, especially around the, the question of physiology and so. If, if we take a sort of a limited description of uh, natural sciences as the identification and description of laws of nature. Okay. All human beings uh, have, have interacted with nature and have identified certain laws. Uh, in terms of physiology, no one can tell me but the Africans never knew that there's a heart and that there's a brain and that their heart works to pump the blood and so on and so forth. So when we speak, and then this might connect with the way do we start, when we speak of decolonization, we're also speaking about uh, making the education contextually relevant. Okay? and also admitting other forms of knowledge and knowledge tradition into the mix of education. A little anecdote, someone told me that uh, recently there was a student or a, uh, a dietitian who was interviewed and uh, she was mentioning that when she was taught uh, how to treat people with diabetes, she was told that uh, these people need to eat salmon. Uh, and, and then she was thinking, where would someone uh, in our uh, locations get salmon? Yeah. And whereas instead of saying that the most important thing is, is for the people to get omega-3s into their system, they are talking about salmon. And that salmon is not contextually relevant. This lady was saying that when you go to a township and, and poor communities, those people cannot afford salmon. Number one, they do not even know what the salmon is. Number two, uh, they cannot even afford it if they know. So now this education, which is physiology and how the body operates and what it needs to deal with certain diseases and so forth, what gets added is a Euro, Eurocentric sort of uh, remedies that are based on someone which is not there. So the first starting point I would say uh, in our decolonization uh, process is to make the education contextually relevant and to take seriously other knowledge forms. You know, some people speak of IKS in a derogatory way. Ah, oh, you're talking IKS. But if we want uh, to decolonize, we need to put the necessary seriousness and emphasis on indigenous knowledge and incorporate it with all the knowledge that is there. I like what the Chinese do where when, when you go to a doctor, they will give you sort of a Western medication and then they will give you a Chinese med uh, medication. And there are studies that suggested that people heal better with that sort of complementary approach uh, to, the, uh, to healing. Uh, we have another question. Uh, what decolonized education should and should not mean? What should decolonized education mean and not mean? What does research say over colonized education? This is from uh, Manzini on the uh, any, any, any thoughts on that? Uh, uh, Question, Comrade Sassandra, what it should mean and what it should not mean? Um, I think that it, I, when, and when I began, probably um, uh, the, 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 the inquirer uh, probably joined us later. I, I said that um, earlier on, um, you know, we need to understand these concepts and, and define them because when we do, we're going to have a common understanding and a common departure. And I said that colonialism refers. Uh, to the violent uh, displacement of a people's cultural values, including philosophy um, and, and everything else. And therefore, when we say the and replacement of that, and so 
um, it means that when 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 de when we are referring to decoloniz decolonization, uh, we're doing away with all forms of um, you know uh, injustices uh, that have been carried out by the Western world um, on the rest of humankind, uh, of making Europe the the point the point the central point of reference and marginalizing the rest of the world. But at the same time, so that's what it means. Um, and therefore, well, that's what uh, colonialism and decolonization means. But also, one of the mistakes or assumptions of a very false one uh, that has been made by many of us um, is to think that um, when we when we speak, you know, about Africanization, and I always prefer to use the the term that was used by Amilka Cabral and speak re-Africanization instead of Africanization, because there's always a false notion that uh, we are trying to take everything that belongs to everyone else and to give it an African gap so that it can look African. And that is not the point. The point is that when we speak African or rather as I prefer re-Africanization and uh, borrowing this from, um, from Amilka Cabral, uh, it is that we are reclaiming that which is ours um, and restoring that which is ours. And uh, you know, entering the world on our own terms. And we are not trying to imitate Europe or anyone else. Um, because, um, you know, what has happened to us is that, um, as you would see, um, you know, uh, what has happened, for instance, in the, in the US of A, when they were uh, dealing with what uh, they refer to black studies, one point was that was picked up and, and you know, the, 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 the decolonization, uh, what they did, was to assume that uh, when you take anyone and everyone who is black skinned and replace that person, uh, I mean, and replace a white professor with a black uh, professor, automatically things are going to change. And so here we confuse um, the, the, skull, the, the skin color, the, the, the politics of color, instead of, you know, the, they call it, uh, you are not preoccupied with a person's color, we are rather we are, you are, you are with the color of his skin but rather you are preoccupied with the color of his or her politics. So let us begin there. When we are busy with the question of Afrocentric education, we are not very concerned, though it is a point, with the color of a person's skin, we are rather interested in the color of a person's politics. Um, that is an important point for us. So that therefore we know that uh, you can easily um, uh, replace a white academic with a, with a black academic only to find out that uh, that black academic is Eurocentric because we must understand that Eurocentrism is a value system. An African person can be Eurocentric and advance Eurocentric values. And so we've got to be very clear about that issue. So we are not advocating um, willy-nilly, you know, um, for that which is not clear. And uh, you know, what has happened in the past is that uh, there are many things that have been referred to as African studies the same way that uh, you'd be given what is referred to as African history, and only to find out that in fact, what is referred to as African history is nothing but Eurocentric history. It is a history about Africa, but written from a Eurocentric perspective. So therefore, when we're speaking about decolonization, we are replacing values, a value system. When we say Afrocentricity, we are speaking about Africans speaking on their own terms, not on borrowed terms. When we're speaking about African studies, we are not referring to those studies that have been carved and developed by Europeans and given to us with an African gap. We are speaking about an overhaul of a system that is unjust, that is racist, um, that marginalizes with that which is just, which is, um, uh, which is fair and which is progressive and not reactionary. Uh, thank you, Comrade. Yeah. Uh, Comrade Pat uh, uh, says that we are still using textbooks that were prescribed uh, during apartheid uh, days. Uh, you know, in, in, in talking about this um, idea of where we should, what does it mean and what does it not mean? I think the, one of the starting points is to realize that uh, all education system, all means of transferring knowledge have a are structured and are based on a certain set of values. What do you privilege? What, what type of knowledge do you privilege? 
comes from the values and uh, and recognition of that allows you to be far more critical to critically engage with, that, with, with whatever you're reading or, or being taught is okay what value system is being advanced here and and part of it is also not just recognizing that the current education is eurocentric one can even recognize the fact that it is also deeply ideological even within its eurocentricity in that what set of uh, knowledge it privileges even within the broader euro uh, centric uh, sort of uh, knowledge uh, canon of knowledge there's some which it leaves out and focuses uh, on the other so the starting point of realizing that and having a critical mind to say what values are being promoted here and where do I, as an individual, where, where does this knowledge place me? Is it placing me at the periphery or is it placing me at the center, which Afrocentricity uh, seems to do that? Uh, I, I am also asking for more questions. Uh, let me just quickly see. Uh, there's a comment here that says the basis of all human development is knowledge of self. This, for me, is the essence of Afrocentricity to fully understand your environment and others. Uh, your first need to understand yourself. Uh, any, any take on that comment, uh, Comrade Sassan? No, I fully, I fully agree that, uh, that that's a very important point, uh, Comrade Chair. Um, I will not uh, elaborate on that. Mm. Okay, so, so we, we will be move, moving towards uh, uh, sort of the Closing, closing last 40 minutes of, of our discussion, Sassan. And normally, I like uh, the closing last sessions to be far more uh, forward looking in terms of what are the policy prescripts that we are advocating for? What are those things that we would like people to go and agitate for and mobilize around in terms of, uh, uh, of, of the changes that they want to see happen in the world? So you've helped us understand broadly the, the, the sort of the, uh, the concepts of decolonization, Eurocentricity, Afrocentricity, and so forth. Now, uh, if uh, I were to, uh, let's say, be a benevolent dictator and say, Sintiwe Sesanti, today, I'm giving you all the power to write our policy on education. Uh, where would uh, Sintiwe Sesanti start? Thank you very much, Comrade uh, Chair. Um, when we speak about uh, policy, we're speaking about guidelines, um, the assumptions that are going to inform um, that uh, which uh, we want and the trajectory. And so let me say that, um, you know, in terms of uh, the, the implications um, of, uh, let, us, let, us, let us talk about the political implications, the social implications and the economic implications um, of what we seek and, um, and what objectives. Um, we're going to, I like the point um, which you made very explicit earlier on Comrade Chair, making reference to two points, that is that uh, we tend to wrongly think that uh, education is value neutral or that it is value free. Education has never been ever value neutral or, or value free. And also education has never been non-ideological. Education has always had an ideological inclination. Uh, because education has always sought to achieve uh, the points that I've, I made reference to the political, the social, and the economy. In terms of, uh, let me begin with the political. The political then, um, you know, we, we, we are striving for the kind of education um, that is uh, going to speak about, I mean, that emphasizes um, human equality, human dignity, um, human freedom um, in the world. And these, all these points are interrelated. And um, without going much into that, let me go to, the, to that uh, which is social. Uh, when we speak about that which is social, you know, um, again, uh, let me make reference to one of the heavyweights um, of our country. Uh, he said that our struggle is that of, um, of uh, advancing and establishing the full humanity, uh, the social development of all human beings. And therefore, at that point, um, this then takes us uh, to a number of uh, variants. But I'd like to emphasize that, uh, which is um, you know, a major challenge for us uh, in the world, not only here, uh, the, gender, the gender issue. I began by saying earlier on that uh, in African um, uh, history, 
uh, we learned that uh, God is neither female nor male. Uh, God is both female and male. God is neither a mother nor a father exclusively. So God is both a mother and a father. Um, we learn from the philosophy of the Aristotle and all that, that uh, women, you know, um, in Greece, ancient Greece, were not, were not regarded as full human beings. Uh, they were minors to their husband in the same way that the children were. And so uh, women and slaves were not regarded as citizens. And so we inherited that patriarchy uh, from Europe. So in terms of Africa, when we speak about um, Afrocentric education, it has got to radically address the issue of patriarchy because one of the falsifications of history has been that, you know, culture, and this has been said in general terms, that culture is oppressive. And yet we know that um, in African culture, women have always occupied a prominent position and that in fact, we have been taught what should be obvious. Um, that uh, the first home of any human being is the womb of a woman. And therefore, women are a priority uh, in life and they should be revered and su as such. Um, we are yet to see a, a, a situation where a man, a woman emerges from the rib of a man. We have never heard about that. We have been told about that. Uh, but we all continue seeing uh, when you see the symbol of a Kemet, uh, the, 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 uh, the, oh dear God, there it leaves me, but I'm sure we, some people, the Ankh, the Ankh, when you look at the Ankh, thank you, Comrade Tabs, it shows you the round figure point is the womb of a woman. And when you see this point on the middle, it is the waist of a woman. And then meaning that human beings, you know, began in their home, the woman, and the gateway to life is the vagina of a woman. And so the vagina is something that must be regarded as sacred and something that must be revered. It must not be something that must be violated. So in the philosophy of our ancestors, from the beginning, they told us that uh, the vagina is a sacred space that must be revered, that must be respected and must never be violated. And uh, historically and practically, when we teach history, we are going to show that throughout the African continent. Um, I was pleasantly surprised recently when I was reading a book by Phyllis Ndandal. Uh, and I read that uh, Tavs in the Eastern Cape, what we refer to as Amathatika Ho Ho. Uh, in fact, Ho Ho was a woman. And so those Amathatika Ho Ho in the Eastern Cape are named after women. And, uh, and that a wife um, called Ohita, uh, I think her name was, uh, she was the queen and the wife of a king of uh, the Koi Koi. I think that's what they were called was the one who replaced the husband and became a military leader. So when we struggle, I mean, when we read history, the history of Africa, you will see that women have always, as we say, you know, from the home of the womb, we emerge and back to Mother Earth we will go. So that uh, women are the starting point and women are the end. So, so those, those are the social implications. And uh, now moving before, to the economy. Before we run out of time, we will move to the economy now. Uh, I, I just only now saw that Lungelo had raised his, his hand, so he wants to ask uh, a question. Lungelo, please proceed with your question. Um, Lungelo, unmute. Unmute. Yes. Can you hear me now, please, comrade? We, we can, we can. Please go ahead. Yes. Um, good afternoon, comrades, and good afternoon to your panelists as well. Perhaps my question then, you would have addressed this question. Um, it, it, um, it, it, it's sim in, in simple terms, um, Afrocentrism and decolonization of, of um, the current education system. We've also, you've also touched on the issue of that uh, education any value system, any education value system that does not exist in isolation. Um, is it possible, my question is simple, is it possible that we can decolonize or achieve um, Afrocentric education system in the absence of uh, economic liberation? Uh, because we all know that um, education uh, uh, is nearly a, uh, is also a, a superstructure of society. Well, when we know that the substructure of society is the economic um, relations of the people. So a, a decolonized and dispossessed people that we are, 
um, can we achieve anything of significance presently in the present form is we are now in 2021. Can all these grand ideas be achieved in the absence of, um, of our economy or land? That's just a, so I would like the prof to just merely um, please attend to the economic issue in, in, in addressing this um, issue of um, education. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, excellent, Jalungel. As he was just about to talk about yes. this, <laughs> you asked a question that's related to that. Brilliant. Uh, 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 over to you. No, very brilliant. Uh, again, in terms of Afrocentric education, we need to emphasize that um, our ancestors, and throughout the African continent, without an exception, uh, you read all the philosophers of Africa, Oyeronka, uh, Oyewumi, Nkurunzegu, Ngugiwationgo, all of them, they tell you, Ramosa, they tell you that African people, our ancestors taught that the land um, uh, uh, can, can, cannot be sold or be bought. Uh, it can never belong, it should never belong to an individual. It is a communal property. And when we speak about the land, we're not merely speaking, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to the, uh, referring to, to where we live and we're referring to the rivers, to the mines, to everything that is, that is here. And so um, when, and, and, and Julius Nyerere explains this and says that uh, when our ancestors taught that the land should not, should not either be bought or be sold, they understood very well that uh, if it was privately owned, those who are the, who are the powerful ones uh, will be the ones who will rule and exploit everyone else. So when our ancestors, uh, you know, came with that economic system that said that uh, none of us has created the land and none of us should monopolize it. It would mean that all the wealth that is to be found uh, there is going to be used for the common good and the common um, you know, development of all human beings that are there. And so therefore, um, when this Afrocentric education advances, it will say, uh, it, or it says um, that uh, the kind of economic system that was exercised by our ancestors um, um, is hostile and, and cannot be reconciled with capitalism. You know, capitalism must go, because the reality of the matter, look at the situation that we're in. Um, you know, from time to time, we may even have a free education. Um, as You know, I don't say Zimbabwe, at the highest number of educated people, but soon, uh, you know, the, the progress uh, that Mugabe had was the one that was used against him. Here where the Zimbabweans were highly educated, uh, but because the economy was being controlled elsewhere, uh, they had nowhere to exercise and they could not be employed, they could not have work. And so here you have an educated force, um, but you know, many excuses will come that people do not have their appropriate skills. At one stage you are told you study economics, there's no way you cannot um, you know, be employed. And people study economics and there they have been made redundant. If you have to do IT, there's no way you can be redundant. And people have studied IT, everything, you, you, you may study anything and everything, but if the economy continues to be manipulated, I mean monopolized, by a few, because the logic of capitalism is that it wants uh, to have maximum profit um, and, uh, and therefore wants uh, to, to, to employ um, people um, uh, who are going to produce for them. And so if there's what they refer to as, as surplus labor, uh, they will cut off people from work and, and dismiss them uh, because they're not useful to them and because capitalism is not willing to give them you know, a, a living wage or something. So therefore, you cannot divorce, uh, you know, um, uh, economics from education. But then um, what is also why, why it is important for us that uh, we do not speak about economic uh, education as, as, um, as separate or divorce from culture is that it is always easy. Um, you know, there, there are some people have made an argument that would prefer to have black capitalists as opposed to white capitalists. But a capitalist is a capitalist because the orientation of capitalism is that of profit. So whether you have a white or a black capitalist, the, the modus operandi is the same. And therefore, it, the, the, and it is for this reason that uh, we're not merely sick talking about uh, you no know, black empowerment in a vacuum. We are speaking about values, values of our ancestors that said that, uh, you know, Kasi Sotobari Fita Homo Utswari Mut, Basho Joaro Akiri, Akiri, Akiri Chavs, yeah. Yeah. Meaning that in African culture, we know that a cattle and everything else are important. But if you were to choose between a cow and a human being, if it means that uh, you must give 
a human being a cow and not have profit rather that because profit must not be the, the major force uh, that is why in um, in our system of africans we had what in Oma, where you would be given a cow and a piece of land to produce and only when you have developed yourself you return that which you have you were have given not on the basis of profit uh, so that all of us as human beings so that education therefore is connected to that and the question is are we able to do it now no we're not able to 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 with the we, we may be able to to effect afrocentric education in our curriculum but um the uh, the objective is is that it must overhaul the system the oppressive and the exploitative system um and when that is done because the point here is that there is an objective what does afrocentric education seek to achieve it seeks to achieve the liberation of humankind but we shall not say that uh, we cannot implement it now because the conditions are not allowing us to do what needs to be done we we because the, the point is we would discuss that you it is not possible to have socialism without socialists it is not possible to have a revolution without revolutionaries so if you are going to have a socialism then you must prepare uh, you must develop socialist thinking people if you're going to have a humane order towards with towards which we aspire then you must create and develop a humane being if we are going to have a revolution then you must build revolutionaries to bring that about so afrocentric education therefore in some in essence is that which seeks uh, to prepare and to orientate and to ve develop uh, agents that are going to bring about a particular order which is in the words of Pantubiko, a humane order excellent uh, <laughs> thank, thank you professor sasanti we we've run out of time and uh, and i feel like we've, we've only scratched the surface uh, there's a lot that we could have spoken about but as this session a uh, time it's one hour 30 minutes uh we, we we've run out of time as i said uh, so thank you very much for your insight i uh, we will make sure to invite you once again uh to come and talk about this uh, uh, further so thank you very much for availing yourself for today's session. And thank you to all of you who've joined us uh, both on Zoom and the various uh, Facebook uh, pages uh, that are from the regions, Limpopo, Eastern Cape, and so forth. Uh, we appreciate you taking time every Sunday to come in and listen to people like Professor Society who share with us uh, Afrocentric knowledge. Thank you very much. On that note, have a good uh, day further and have a good weekend. Uh, <laughs> bye.